Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. I don't think I really recall when I first learned or memorized the Lord's Prayer, but it's a pretty safe bet it's been over 50 years ago. And I'm sure there are some of you who could add maybe five or ten or more years onto that number. Well, over the course of that time, there have been portions of the Lord's Prayer that have uh, held more interest or more meaning uh, for me and for others. For instance, calling upon God as our Father speaks of a, an intimate relationship with God as a, a heavenly parent, a loving parent. And focusing our, and anticipating God's kingdom coming and God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven is a call of hope and a desire for justice and love throughout the world. Of course, one of the hallmarks of the prayer is the uh, desire for us that we forgive those as we have been forgiven, which speaks of the sweeping and seemingly impossible task uh, of, of loving and forgiving those who have wronged us, and the even more radical notion of reconciliation with them and with the whole world. But perhaps the part of this prayer that has gotten less attention for me and for many others has been that part that says, give us this day our daily bread. I can safely say that concern about where my next meal will come from has never been much of an issue. Uh, in fact, if I would just uh, limit myself to three meals a day, I think I'd find I'd do a whole lot better. I know that for many, the issue of hunger or few food insecurity is not really much of a problem but it is for some people. And so the inclusion of this particular petition in Jesus' prayer probably reflects an ongoing reality among the people of the first century in which Jesus lived. Within the Roman Empire, there was an ever-growing income disparity between the wealthy elites and the rest of the people, the poorer classes. And so things like food insecurity and scarcity were often chronic for many and certainly seasonal for most. Things like droughts or wars or civil conflicts would also significantly impact the availability of food very negatively. And therefore Jesus' prayer asking God to daily provide food for people was probably one of the most primary concerns of those who followed Jesus and listened to him preach. Which brings us to our gospel for today, which is commonly known as the feeding of the 5,000. The feeding of the 5,000 does not start out as a story about feeding hungry people and in the ensuing miracle that follows. It begins with Jesus having just heard that his cousin, John the Baptist, has been beheaded by Herod in Galilee. And so Jesus gets into a boat, and he goes to a deserted place almost as if he is fleeing and hiding out. Well, if he was trying to hide out, he picked a pretty poor spot, because it says the crowds heard about where Jesus was, and they came by the thousands on foot, to see him there. Well, why did these people come? It was it just because he was a great preacher? Well, it says when Jesus saw them, he had compassion for them and cured many people who were sick. People be came because they knew Jesus could heal their sick family members, their friends, and so they brought them to see Jesus. Now, have you ever wondered why there are so many sick people in the Bible? I mean, everywhere you read, there's so many stories, story after story of sick people coming to see uh, the Lord or coming to see a prophet. Well, the issue of health and sickness goes back to the issue of hunger and poverty, where people do not have enough 
food, and so they suffer from diseases of deprivation, things like malnutrition. And when someone has, has, is malnourished, that person cannot uh, withstand their immunity has been compromised. And so they fall, uh, fall ill to many and various diseases. So the people in the story have followed Jesus to this deserted place because they want to experience his healing power. This takes the better part of the day, and when evening comes, the disciples come to Jesus because they have a problem, or they see a problem. They see the hungry crowds as a problem, and they want Jesus to send them away. And so they do. They come to Jesus with these words. But Jesus doesn't want to send the people away. Jesus said to them, you feed them. You feed them. And their reply is, we have nothing but five loaves and two fish. And hardly enough to feed uh, 12 or 13 hungry men, let alone 5,000. But Jesus says, bring them here to me. And then he orders the crowd to sit down on the grass. And then he takes the five loaves and the two fish. And he looked up to heaven and he blessed and he broke that. Does that sound familiar? And then he gave them to the disciples, and then the disciples went out and gave them to the crowds, and all ate and were filled. They were filled. Not just satisfied, but filled, something that would have rarely been an experience for them on a, a daily basis, or let alone even once a year. Jesus took what little they had and blessed it and all were fed. Jesus looked at the crowds with their sickness and their hunger and their poverty, and he didn't see a problem. He had compassion for them. And then he healed them and ordered his followers to feed them. And so what appears to start off as a healing story turns into a miracle story. Jesus uses what little resources his followers have and blesses it and then sends them out to serve. And so hungry people are fed. You know, there's a similar story that's been going around United Lutheran this week about how God blesses the resources we have and hungry people are fed. <clears throat> this past week and the, and the two following weeks, uh, United is engaged in a lunch program to feed hungry people, especially children, in our neighborhood. It continues a program that was started by St. Joseph's Social Care and has been going on, that was going on in June and July, but they had to stop for lack of funds and volunteers. And so our outreach and wellness ministry believed that we should and could step into this void and provide meals to hungry children. And they took literally Jesus' call to his followers that we should feed them. And so donations and volunteers were asked for, and people have been stepping up. And so on Monday, a little over 100 people were served. Tuesday, 131. Wednesday, 140. Thursday, 160. So approximately 545 meals were served to people who were hungry. So clearly the issue of hunger is still a part of our, our community and our time and our place. Well, Jesus taught his followers to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Jesus teaches that it is God's will that hungry people should be fed. And you know, the Bible is full of passages that speak about this desire for God for hungry people to be fed. The prophet Isaiah writes, If you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall shine and rise in the darkness and your gloom like the noonday sun. And then later on in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus declares that individuals and even whole nations shall be judged on whether or not they have provided food to the hungry and clothing to the naked. Images of heaven are often described as a great banquet 
where all people are fed and there is never a lack for food. There is a clear mandate from God that it is God's will that the poor and the hungry are fed. And Jesus takes it a step further and says that his followers are the ones to feed them. Well, hunger in America and around the world is really not an issue of not having enough food or resources to go around. It's that some of us have too much and others have too little. It's therefore a justice issue, a matter of political will. And we could talk all day about politics of hunger and poverty in America and the world, but you know what? That's not what's going on in our gospel for today. No, it's not about talking, it's not about judging, or it's not even about solving problems. If we listen to Jesus, we clearly hear him saying that sometimes, sometimes we just have to feed hungry people. We have to gather what resources we have and then ask God to bless them and then go out to serve expecting that miracles can happen. I want you to turn now in your red hymnals. I want you to turn to hymn number 729. Hymn 729. And it's a hymn that I think speaks clearly about uh, the world that we live in and the changes that the church's experiences and, and the way that we still have hungry people among us. And, and so instead of the one that's listed in your bulletin, we're going to sing this as our hymn of the day. Hymn 729, The Church of Christ in Every Age. <laughs> 